So today we're going to talk about the incredible power that internet technologies have given us. And while in so many ways this more connected world has allowed for so much growth and good to flourish, hate and evil have found new ways to propagate as well. And some creative ways that each one of us are fighting it and how you can help. We've got a great group of presenters with us today. Rachel Fish, the Executive Director of the Foundation to Combat Extremism. Dylan Hosier, the Chief Advocacy Officer of the Israeli American Civic Action Network. And our first speaker today, Amy Spitalnik, the Executive Director of Integrity First for America. But before we jump into presentations, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the work at the Center for Technology and Society at ADL. ADL Center for Technology and Society is a new part of the 107-year-old organization. Its mission is to stop the defamation of the Jewish people and secure justice and fair treatment to all in digital spaces. Our focus is on measuring hate online, policy and advocacy, incident response, and funding and conducting research into hate online in all its forms. We interact daily with tech platforms like Facebook and Google, Twitter and Reddit, and we work closely with our Center on Extremism, who have been infiltrating and tracking extremist organizations and individuals for decades. We work on tech policy, advocacy, applied research, and for the first time ever, building tools to measure and track hate online at internet scale. And more about that in a moment. Our work pushes lawmakers, tech companies, and platforms to improve their policies and behaviors, but we also speak truth to power holding them accountable for their action or deliberate inaction. To better understand some of what's going on online, ADL did a nationally representative survey last year and 53% of Americans reported being harassed online, over half. 41% have been called names and 30% of the US population reported being severely harassed online physical threats, sexual harassment, stalking, or worse. And in July, the Center for Technology and Society conducted a survey of hate and harassment in the online gaming world, the first of its kind. And what we found surprised us. In online multiplayer games, 74% of American gamers reported being harassed, usually over voice chat. So imagine the way that we're talking and we're speaking now with headphones where people can hear your voices. 67% were called offensive names. 65%, nearly two thirds, reported being severely harassed. 44% were physically threatened. And 50% reported having been discriminated against by a stranger of their basis of, on the basis of their identity. But most alarmingly, 23% of gamers reported being exposed to discussions about the superiority of whites, the inferiority of non-whites, white identity, or a home for the white race. I'm gonna play a short video for you. It was produced by our office to illustrate the real harm of criminal activity online. What you're about to see depicts real stories of individuals who have been targets of cyber stalking, doxing, swatting, and other online crimes. And before I start the video, and there may be a little bit of lag, just so you're aware, I wanted to warn you of the potentially triggering information and imagery. In this video, even with that, we think it's important to tell these stories as they are, but sometimes the depictions can be hard to watch. You can threaten to murder me threatened to rape my daughter, who's five. The police can't help me. Neither can the courts. So yeah, go ahead. Publish my home address online. Make a false police report and have a SWAT team deploy to my home. Because you don't like people like me. Like me. Like me. Like me. You cost me my reputation. My safety. My job. My business. But you have nothing to worry about. Because laws that should protect me are outdated. Or don't exist at all. So no consequences for you. And no protections for me. 
until we have the laws to fight back. It doesn't have to be like this. So the center of technology and society is leading the way on this. We're pushing a legislative effort called Backspace Hate. Our 2020 goals are to support bills in five states and get passage in at least one state to formalize our federal advocacy strategy and identify two to three other states to expand to in 2021. I'd like to note that we've already hit our 2020 goals with a recent success. The anti-swatting bill with our model language in Washington state just passed both the House and Senate unanimously and is sitting on the governor's desk awaiting his signature. Now, hopefully he'll actually make it into his desk given what's going on, but uh, we expect that that's gonna happen shortly. But that's not all, because social networking algorithms traditionally optimize for engagement. The Center for Technology and Society is working with social networks and other social platforms to identify anti-Semitism and online hate and provide tools to reduce the spread, to de-amplify their reach, to mitigate it without censoring, providing a way to reduce the spread of these messages while protecting civil liberties. At the same time, we're also doing a lot of research to be able to better understand and then be able to combat what's going on online so that we can actually understand and move forward, like what, on, what online interventions actually work and how to better measure the hate that's actually going on online. I'd just like to tell you a little bit about my personal history. I'm trained as a computer scientist and I'm based in San Francisco. I've been building companies and tech organizations for 25 years, most recently holding executive positions at Lyft and at Reddit. So I've been on the inside, know the players and how they think. But I'm also a son of a Holocaust survivor and hidden child. These are the Star of David badges issued to my family after the Nazis invaded Belgium and my mother's family went into hiding. Her family was split up and she survived by being hidden by the resistance. She survived, she persevered, and she flourished. And this is my mother, Anna, along with being a fantastic mom, Anna also became a teacher a public school teacher to hundreds of children and young adults, teaching her experience of the Holocaust. This is her bearing witness to a class showing actually the false identity papers that, she, that her father had to wear to escape the, the, uh, the genocide. Now this is why I chose to leave the for-profit tech world and to do this work. As I saw what was going on in the world of online spaces that I, contributed to and helped to build, I saw the same kinds of patterns showing up. And they say that history doesn't repeat itself, but it sure does rhyme. And with that comes a corresponding responsibility that these, these, these genocides don't come out of nowhere. And it's up to each of us to be aware and awake and do everything we can to help stop this. So ADL and the Center for Technology and Society stands with you. Our job is to do some of the heavy lifting that individuals can't do alone. And this starts with measurement because measurement helps us to prioritize where to put the bulk of our, our efforts. This year, we will release software tools that starting with anti-Semitism will allow for a standardized measurement of the amount of hate on the internet. In conjunction with this work, our Backspace Hate Initiative is getting laws on the books to create criminal and civil penalties for perpetrators of cyber stalking, doxing, swatting, and non-consensual pornography, common sense laws. And we will continue our work funding and doing applied research to better understand the ecosystem of hate online, its effects on targets and victims, and how it propagates and how to attenuate it, and to explore and bring light to wherever hate, extremism, and anti-Semitism rears its head. Thank you. Now, before we take questions, which I think we'll do at the end, I'd like to bring this on to our first presenter, Amy Spitalnik, the Executive Director of Integrity First for America. 
so she can speak about Science versus Kessler, the lawsuit filed by a coalition of Charlottesville community members against the Nazis and white supremacists responsible for the violence. So as Dave said, Integrity First for America is the civil rights nonprofit behind the lawsuit brought by 10 Charlottesville community members against the two dozen neo-Nazis, white supremacists, and hate groups responsible for the August 2017 violence. Um, and before I dive in and walk you through what happened two and a half years ago, our litigation and its potential impacts, I want to echo something that Dave said. Um, I, like Dave, I am the descendant of Holocaust survivors and the granddaughter of survivors. In fact, my grandmother's name was Anna, much like Dave's mother. Um, and for me, this is also deeply personal. And I think um, it's, it's hard to look at what we are doing right now, what I think everyone on this panel is doing right now, and not seeing the ways in which it rhymes with history, even if it isn't a direct reflection. Um, and so I'm very, grateful for all of you for taking the time to be here. I wish we could be in here uh, together in person and hopefully we will in the future. Um, but I look forward to connecting with you at least virtually here. Um, to, to get started, I think what's happened over the last few weeks has really put a sharp point on the importance of, of the work we're doing. The pandemic has only underscored how this threat of white supremacist terror and hate remains one of the most serious threats both to the Jewish community and to our national security writ large. What happened in Charlottesville two and a half years ago was not an accident. It was the result of meticulous planning months in advance on a number of social media sites, including a chat platform called Discord, which is typically frequented by video gamers. Um, on those chat platforms, starting in the spring before this August 2017 Unite the Right violence, um, these neo-Nazis, white supremacists, and hate groups were in various different channels talking about everything from what to wear, what to bring for lunch, which weapons to carry, and even how they could hit protesters with cars and then claim self-defense, which is, of course, exactly what they ultimately did. So when they descended on Charlottesville in August 2017, none of that was an accident. First, on the Friday night of that weekend, we all know the images of them marching with tiki torches and other Nazi paraphernalia. The torches were specifically meant to be evocative of both the Nazis and the KKK. And they were chanting things like, Jews will not replace us, which is a direct call to something called replacement theory, um, which is meant to, which is a conspiracy theory that the Jews are basically the puppeteers behind a broader effort to replace the white race with, my, with minorities. Um, and that is something that we saw over and over again, not just in Charlottesville throughout the course of that weekend, but in almost every other major, major white supremacist attack over the last two and a half years. Um, on Friday night, ultimately, these neo-Nazis descended on the rotunda at the University of Virginia, surrounded a small group of counter protesters at the Thomas Jefferson statue, including a number of students and other UVA community members, threw torches at them, fuel, beat them up while chanting things like Jews will not replace us in blood and soil. Um, a number of our plaintiffs who were there that night said they thought that they were gonna die. A few blocks away was an interfaith service organized by a number, another one of our plaintiffs, uh, a reverend, um, and they had to shelter in place for fear of their lives. Um, and so that was just one piece of the puzzle. The next day, I think we all know the iconic images of these neo-Nazis and white supremacists descending on downtown Charlottesville for me, one of the most sort of harrowing anecdotes from that day was when they surrounded the local synagogue, which is a fairly small synagogue. They had already, the synagogue had already adjusted Shabbat prayer time um, and evacuated some of their Torahs. And as the Nazis descended, they fully evacuated out the back, brought every possible Torah they could, including a Torah that had been rescued from Nazi Germany. And to me, um, to hear that a Torah that was once under Nazi threat was yet again under Nazi threat, this time in 2017 on the streets of an American city has just been heartbreaking. And these neo-Nazis of course surrounded the synagogue chanting things like seek Heil, talking about torching those Jewish monsters. Um, and it was, it was truly a scene that I think me personally and I imagine many of you could never imagine happening in our country, but it did. Um, and of course the violence continued throughout the day um, they descended on Emancipation Park, 
which was home to the Robert E. Lee statue that was the guise under which they had supposedly gone to Charlottesville to protest the removal of that statue. They were simultaneously posting in their online chat still while marching, including things like first stop Charlottesville, next stop Auschwitz. Um, and then ultimately, they did exactly what they had talked about in those chats. They plowed a car into a crowd of peaceful counter protesters, killing Heather Heyer and injuring many others, including a number of our plaintiffs. If you know that iconic Pulitzer photo of the car hitting the crowd, you can actually see some of our plaintiffs in it, including Marcus Martin, the African-American man slayed over the back of the car, um, and Thomas Baker, who's sort of flipping over the hood of the car in that photo. Marcus actually pushed his then fiance, now wife, Marissa out of the way of the oncoming car. Both were injured. They had been there with Heather, who was Marissa's coworker. They both worked as paralegals. Um, and so on behalf of 10 Charlottesville community members who were injured in the violence, IFA is backing this landmark federal lawsuit to hold accountable those responsible for orchestrating what happened. And this is not a speech case. This is not an incitement case. This is a conspiracy case. It's a case about actions using a number of civil rights statutes, including something called the Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871. We're bringing to court the two dozen le leaders and hate groups that had planned the violence in advance via those chats and then executed it on the streets of Charlottesville in August 2017. Um, it's uh, the KKK Act was first passed to protect recently freed slaves from Klan vigilante violence in the South following the end of the Civil War. It's been used a number of times since to protect against other racially motivated violent conspiracies, including during the Freedom Rider era. Um, and much like a number of the other civil rights statutes that have been used in, uh, for, against, um, used by private plaintiffs against those responsible for hate crimes, it has the potential to win massive civil judgments for our plaintiffs and essentially bankrupt and dismantle those responsible for what happened. Um, and I think that's, that's really one of the most important points here to understand that our case is certainly about justice for the plaintiffs and for the Charlottesville community. There has been very little accountability. James Fields, who wrote the car, and a handful of these other extremists have faced criminal cases, but there hasn't been a broad-based um, effort to hold accountable the full coalition of those responsible for this violence. Um, but more so, and in, for ways that I think this group will particularly appreciate and understand, we believe that this is the only legal effort in the country right now to take on and court the leaders of the violent white supremacist movement and bankrupt and dismantle them through these sorts of large judgments. Um, and that is both unique and so important in hindering their ability to operate. We've seen that historically with cases against the Ku Klux Klan in the South in the 80s and 90s. Um, and we see the ways in which the defendants in our suit are truly interconnected and at the center of this larger movement. There's so much to say on this front, but just a few examples. Um, we know that, for example, Robert Bowers, the Pittsburgh shooter, communicated with some of the Charlottesville leaders before killing 11 at Tree of Life two, uh, a year and a half ago. We know that the Christ Church shooter painted onto his gun a symbol called the Fash Tag, first popularized by Matthew Heimbach, one of our defendants. And then, of course, the Christ Church shooting has been known to inspire the Poway shooting, the El Paso shooting. And so it's part of this larger cycle of violence in which each attack is used to inspire the next. And in virtually all of these cases, we see connections back to our own defendants in this suit and how Charlottesville was not an isolated incident, but rather a flashpoint in this rise of white supremacy. Um, a few final points, and then I'll pass it back to Dave and would be thrilled to take whatever questions folks have at the end. I think it's truly important to understand that at the core of the white supremacist movement is a virulent anti-Semitism. That is really what motivates them above and beyond any other form of hate. We see that in the replacement theory that they perpetuate and promote the fact that they really truly believe the Jewish community are the puppeteers responsible for everything terrible happening in the world, including um, any successes African-Americans, Latinos, immigrants, refugees, and other communities have. And we didn't just see that in Charlottesville where they chanted Jews will not replace us, but we saw that in Pittsburgh where Bowers targeted Tree of Life because they had a partnership with Hyas and worked on supporting refugees. We saw that in Christ Church. We saw that in Poway, we saw that in El Paso. We see it over and over again in these, both in these larger scale attacks and in the smaller forms of white supremacist terror and hate um, that folks at the ADL and IFA and elsewhere are tracking every day. And so while 
of course, these individuals and groups hate everyone. They hate African Americans, they hate Latinos, they hate LGBTQ individuals, they hate um, refugees and immigrants and Muslims and everyone. It is, I think, important to underscore the ways in which this anti-Semitism truly motivates all of those other forms of hate. And sadly, we see it personally in the threats they make against us. This is an effort led by three Jewish women, myself and our two lead counsels, Roberta Kaplan and Karen Dunn. And more than anything, they target our Jewish faith and our background in their attacks. Um, so that, I think that's an important point. And finally, um, I would just also like to underscore the ways in which even before we get to trial, and trial is currently scheduled for October 20, uh, 2020 this year, there might be a slight delay depending on what happens with the courts as we come out of this mess. Um, but we anticipate going to trial um, very soon, if not in October, soon thereafter. And even before we get to trial, we're already seeing the tangible impacts of um, of this case. Richard Spencer, one of our defendants who coined the term alt-right, has talked about how this case is, quote, totally detrimental to his ability to operate. League of the South, a neo-Nazi hate group, has said they can't open a new headquarters because of the case. Elliot Klein, uh, another neo-Nazi leader, was thrown in jail and sanctioned thousands of dollars um, as part of our case, as have other defendants. Um, and so, when we think about the impact we've already had on their ability to operate, um, just imagine the impact of winning massive civil judgments at trial and truly bankrupting and dismantling their ability to operate in the longer term. Um, IFA is supporting this case directly, which means we are funding um, security costs, evidence collection, and other third party needs in this case. The legal work itself is being done largely pro bono, but in a case like this, given the threats that we face, um, there are a number of other major significant costs to ensure our legal team, plaintiffs, and expert witnesses are protected at trial and in the, um, in the previous depositions and hearings and have the resources they need to win and to succeed. Um, so thank you so much for, for joining us here. Looking forward to your questions at the end. Um, and I will pass it back to Dave um, and look forward to talking to you all soon. Thank you so much, Amy, and uh, it's really, it's God's work um, that you and your team are doing. So I just want to point out before we hand off to Dylan, um, who's going to be speaking next, that on the bottom of your screens, uh, you should see next to like the mute and the video buttons or what have you, like the, there's a, there's a Q&A button that you can click. And so if there's a question that comes to mind, you know, during any of our present presenters, uh, presentations. Um, feel free to type in your question there and then when we get done after Dylan and Rachel uh, finish speaking, we'll absolutely be going to your Q&A and trying to, uh, to answer as many of those questions as possible. Um, so with that, um, let me hand off now to, um, to our next speaker, Dylan Hosier, the Chief Advocacy Officer of the Israeli American Civic Action Network. Dylan? Uh, so, great to uh, be with you all here today virtually. Um, today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the legislative and policy arena, um, focusing on um, bills and, and legislation. Um, you know, Dave, you had mentioned your Backspace Hate Initiative um, and, and focusing on many uh, state legislatures. Um, what I'm going to do today is uh, talk a little bit about the value of legislative initiatives do a little bit of an assessment on uh, recent campaigns focusing on uh, anti-BDS legislation at the state level, and then looking at the uh, recent uh, uptick in um, definitions of anti-Semitism at the uh, state and local level, also in Congress, then talk about new opportunities um, that we take away uh, from the lessons of these, of these campaigns. So first, just to introduce ourselves, uh, we are ICANN. Uh, we're an advocacy organization for activists who identify as Israeli, American or Israeli American who are working together to fight for a better America, a more secure Israel and a stronger US Israel Alliance. Our unique approach joins Israeli immigrants with American supporters to lead grassroots advocacy efforts on domestic and foreign policy issues at the local, state and federal level. Um, Israelis living in America, we have found, are, have proven to be a vital asset in securing the special alliance between the U.S. and Israel. We work to get those um, Israelis living in America more engaged in civics. Um, we are 
right now, um, kind of two organizations. Our primary organization is a 501c4 advocacy organization. And we have an affiliate uh, 501c3 that's focused on civic education. And um, later this year, we'll see, we'll um, look at launching a potential 527s to support candidates. Just to introduce myself, uh, as David said, I'm the Chief Advocacy Officer at ICANN. Um, I've been doing public policy lobbying advocacy for 18 years. Uh, prior to my most recent position, I served as the political officer for the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs at the Israeli consulate uh, covering the US Pacific Southwest. I've worked on Iran sanctions legislation at the uh, local, state, and federal level. Also worked on uh, several anti-BDS um, uh, campaigns, legislative initiatives, also at the local, state, and federal level. And I've spearheaded many uh, US-Israel cooperative agreements. And I've been a lobbyist in probably far too many states um, and also in Congress. I think we're like 13 states from California, Missouri, all the way to, to Massachusetts. Let's talk a little bit about the, the value of legislative initiatives. Legislation is an extremely powerful tool. I just want to reiterate this so just to kind of frame the discussion. It, it really helps to create policy frameworks and establishes new social norms. And it can really change the trajectory of a city, state, or even a nation. Consider the Civil Rights Acts of 1875 and 1964, the Equal Pay Act of 1963, and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And also more, more recently, we had a phenomenal um, uh, state-level campaign of Iran sanctions. Um, again, coast to coast, 33 states have uh, Iran sanctions legislation. Um, I'm going to focus a little bit on California during this presentation. I think California is an interesting case study. Um, California has some of the strongest Iran sanctions legislation in the country. Um, it also has a very strong anti-BDS uh, uh, framework in place. And it also has a unique uh, California-Israel agreement in place. You see um, Prime Minister Netanyahu and Jerry Brown there shaking hands in the lower, lower corner there. Um, so California is an interesting case study to look at for the state-level legislation. Uh, it's also important to note that when we're working with, uh, with legislation, the opposition is present. Um, we've seen a kind of a, an alliance between the ACLU, Jewish Voice for Peace and Care, um, at every level of government, in cities, city councils, uh, state legislatures, and of course in Congress. And they are pushing pro-BDS anti-Israel policies as often as they can. Um, and they're incredibly efficient and effective. They really operate um, at a fraction of the cost of other um, comparable organizations. Um, and they very importantly engage in grassroots electoral poli politics where many uh, um, Jewish or pro-Israel organizations don't necessarily engage in that kind of activity. Um, this allows them to put candidates in place and to engage in party, um, party activities that, that push their agenda. So for example, when you see it again in California, a lot of the anti-Israel resolutions um, from the California Democratic Party, that's from a handful of um, Jewish Voice for Peace, Care and ACLU activists. So it's something to, uh, something to bear in mind. Um, let's take a look at, at anti-BDS. Um, I think we're all aware, we've, we've seen the headlines. Um, you know, 29 states have some sort of anti-BDS policy. Uh, across the country, again, coast to coast. Um, this kicked off in 2015 uh, at a state-by-state -state campaign, also uh, certain federal bills that were, that were introduced. Um, moving forward to today, to, in 2020, if you look at the surface, it appears that there's 281 million Americans, or 85% of Americans, uh, covered by anti-BDS policy. We'll get into answering that a little bit later into whether or not that's, that is actually the case. Um, but there's three models. There's the boycott, the boycotters approach that, that most states have employed. Um, there's anti-discrimination uh, models where we talk about how BDS really is a discriminatory movement um, or can be a discriminatory movement. And then there's resolutions that's, that really are uh, symbolic and, and have no force of law. Uh, at ICANN, we've recently completed a 50 state survey, which we'll be releasing soon, um, which analyzed all of this. We're gonna give you a preview here in this presentation uh, what this map looks like, here are the 29 states total that have anti-BDS policy. That looks fantastic. I think on the surface, that's a headline that many people have seen and, and many people have been proud of. Um, what we did was we recently completed a, um, an analysis of each of these states and the statutes and um, the various federal challenges that have been um, raised against a few of the states. 
we've seen a few problems. Um, so again, looking through this, we've seen one state, there's one state that has a resolution, it's Tennessee. Two states have an anti-discrimination model of, of anti-BDS, that's in California and in Nevada. And 26 states have the boycott to boycotters approach. Here's the problem. The boycott to boycotters model contains two constitutional deficiencies. And this is important to understand when we're pursuing legislation uh, really at any level of government. Um, but uh, with this boycott, the boycotters approach, there are First Amendment issues. There are some serious First Amendment concerns. Um, and there are also Commerce Clause issues um, in, in each of these uh, models of legislation. Now, because of these deficiencies, ACLU and others are going state by state to challenge these, uh, these statutes. Um, one of the serious issues is that Congress never granted the state's authority to engage in international commerce or interstate commerce related to combating BDS. Um, you see a note there on Iran sanctions. The, the boycott the boycotters approach was modeled on the very successful um, Iran sanctions uh, legislation, uh, which started back in 2007. Um, in 2015, uh, there was one model that had been introduced in Illinois um, that had been copied by several states, uh, and it didn't take into consideration the unique challenges that are presented um, when, when trying to engage in anti-BDS and follow that same model at the state level. Um, unfortunately, in, in Congress at the federal level, the last BDS bill, which was passed by Congress and signed by a president, was in 2015. Um, there have been several bills that have been introduced in Congress, uh, the Combating BDS Act, the Israel Anti-Boycott Act, um, but none of these have, uh, have passed and have been sent on to a president. So what does the state map actually look like? We have two bills that are constitutional in our view. Uh, based on our analysis, that's in California and in Nevada. You had three states um, that had legal challenges that were uh, dismissed, primarily because the states revised their statutes to make the plaintiffs uh, lose standing. Uh, these states did not address the core constitutional challenges. They simply modified um, some aspects of the statute that made their, their plaintiffs um, um, kind of irrelevant in those cases. And you have two current cases, one in Arkansas and one in Georgia. Um, it's possible that the Georgia one will get thrown out. Uh, the Arkansas case, uh, which is um, uh, the plaintiff is a, a newspaper, um, that poses a serious challenge. Uh, the ways that Kansas and Texas and Arizona change their statutes uh, will not uh, do away with that plaintiff in Arkansas. So that, that could pose a serious challenge for us. Um, on this issue. Lessons learned. Uh, unfortunately, uh, again, state level anti-BDS, in our view, has largely failed. Um, this, this model did not start with the correct model, or sorry, the, uh, the models at the state level anti-BDS did not start with a, a correct approach. Um, and there wasn't really a rigorous assessment. There was a kind of a simplistic approach where um, policymakers in Illinois, which I'll call patient zero, um, uh, they tried to append anti-BDS onto Iran sanctions and Sudan sanctions legislation without taking into consideration the various constitutional concerns. And so this largely created a situation where a lot of these bills either have no effect, um, they have no outcome, or there are serious constitutional deficiencies. Um, so our lessons here that, that we learned looking at this approach and doing this, this, uh, this survey um, is that you really have to start out in the very beginning with a rigorous approach, a rigorous assessment, consulting different legal perspectives. You can't have one perspective that has a certain viewpoint that you like and then you know, try to replicate this uh, across the country. Also assess the value. Um, again, this anti-BDS uh, model in these 26 states was focused on Iran sanctions. When we had to run sanctions legislation state by state, we actually had an assessment that said, this many hundreds of millions of dollars will be removed from the Iranian economy uh, in the nuclear and energy sector. Um, as a result of this, I can actually go back and look today and you can see the hundreds of millions and actually billions of dollars um, state by state that has been removed from the, um, uh, the energy sector in Iran to help prevent them from getting a nuclear weapon. We cannot do the same necessarily with, with anti-BDS. Um, so in our view, um, it was, a, it was a, um, a difficult model to start out with and it's caused some serious challenges today. So here are some key takeaways. Uh, fighting BDS at home versus abroad. States and cities should adopt the anti-discrimination model. Um, states and cities are better equipped to look at how BDS discriminates against their residents. 
Um, so in California, they simply appended the, um, or up, kind of upgraded their uh, anti-discrimination statutes to recognize that BDS um, does actually infringe, especially upon Israelis um, and Jewish Americans. Um, and so that's been a very successful approach, it's been a very successful model, um, the same in Nevada. Um, and let's leave it to Congress to fight BDS internationally. There's been the Israel Anti-Boycott Act that was introduced in the past Congress, which was just recently introduced in the current Congress. Um, Congress is best equipped to fight BDS internationally. It has the tools and it has the constitutional authority to do so. I think it's also very important uh, to couch BDS as discriminatory. Um, fighting BDS, in our view, it's our civil rights movement. Um, there, there really are actual cases where we can say that BDS is discriminatory. We've fought for, for many years in the state of Massachusetts to try to get anti-BDS statutes on the books. The last two years, we've focused on this discriminatory aspect. Um, I think we've been largely successful in convincing more and more legislators there in that state about the discriminatory nature of BDS. Um, and so I think that, that, that there's a real opportunity for us there to talk about how BDS is discriminatory. Um, and also there's bipartisan value. Uh, in our analysis, we looked at the partisan breakdown of states that have passed anti-BDS statutes across the country over the past several years. Democrats were just as willing and they did pass BDS legislation as compared to Republicans, um, especially when the de discriminatory aspects were discussed. Uh, California was the first state to have a democratic trifecta, that's a democratic governor, democratic senate, democratic uh, lower chamber in the assembly um, that passed anti-BDS uh, and it passed by a wide margin. Uh, Nevada, the Nevada legislature, uh, again, strong democratic uh, control that year it was passed and really anchoring BDS as a discriminatory movement was very effective in that case. So next steps with combating BDS, we'll wait to see the results of cases in Arkansas and in Georgia. Uh, we'll encourage and continue to ask Congress to uh, pass the Israel Anti-Boycott Act. And we'll look to employ the California anti-discrimination model in more states across the country. So um, I think another way we want to uh, talk about ways to combat BDS, uh, we call it kind of um, tongue in cheek, pick Israel. Uh, a good way to, to combat boycotts, divestments and sanctions is to work on partnerships, investments and collaborations. Um, it, it, here in California, we worked on a Israel-California MOU, which fostered a, uh, a slew of agreements and, and, and partnerships. One uh, that was done recently was on stem cell research. Um, this really changed the conversation about Israel uh, um, across the state and among uh, policymakers and their staff. Uh, this is really going on the offense. So we really need to kind of, you know, not just react to what uh, pro BDS movement, the pro BDS movement is doing, but also look at um, ways that we can go really go on the offense and engage in um, uh, new activities uh, to, that foster new partnerships, investments, and collaboration between the U.S. and Israel um, at the local, state, and national level. I want to take a little bit uh, uh, of time here to talk about anti-Semitism, the definition of anti-Semitism. Uh, there's been an effort to kick this off in 2020. Um, the city of Beverly Hills actually at the municipal level passed uh, the definition just uh, back in January. Um, there are many state legislatures across the country that have some form of uh, anti-Semitism definition. They're currently under consideration. Um, and of course, Congress is considering the Anti-Semitism Awareness Act was passed in the Senate unanimously. Um, uh, again, uh, strong bipartisan support uh, in the last Congress. Um, unfortunately, has not been taken up in successive Congresses. Um, uh, and, and the current model that's being considered uh, in many state legislatures and in municipalities and in Congress does not have the kind of constitutional deficiencies that we see with the anti-BDS legislation. Um, so this is a strong model. This is a, a very successful model. I and I think that um, this is a, a very positive way forward. Um, and it's good for us to kind of continue uh, pushing back against discriminatory aspects uh, of BDS in this way uh, and defining anti-Semitism. So let's look at uh, new opportunities, just a few here. So uh, one of the things that we saw was that engaging new Jewish communities in civics is extremely powerful. Uh, just to talk about Israelis and BDS, um, Israelis living in America are a unique community and are uniquely equipped to fight BDS. And the reason why is because they are the only community that can talk about their national origin and how BDS discriminates and marginalizes against them on that basis. No other community has that power. And so when we partner Israelis, supporters, uh, Israelis with American supporters to combat BDS, that narrative 
uh, is extremely strong. Um, and we saw the same, by the way, with Persian Jews in Iran. There's a unique and compelling narrative. So what we do is we teach Jewish immigrants, whether they're Persian, Israeli, or, or otherwise, about civic engagement and the power of civic action. The authenticity is extremely powerful. Um, here is one of our activists, uh, Lee Moore, in uh, the Massachusetts State House testifying um, just a few months ago. Um, she's, a, she's a mother. Um, she's actually a, a scientist uh, in, in uh, the Boston area. And that was her first time testifying and, and seeing a, a mother go up and tell her story to talk about anti-Semitism and what it means to her and her family is an extremely powerful and compelling narrative uh, and tool for advocacy. Uh, engage in every level of government. Uh, work more in city councils and state legislatures. Our opposition is already there. Um, in Los Angeles, uh, several years ago, uh, Pro-BDS uh, activists tried to get the uh, city of Los Angeles to divest from companies um, that were doing business with Israel. Um, luckily, the city council had pushed back. Um, and we see the same now in Missouri. I, I, I haven't seen state legislation like this um, come up in the past, but there actually is a uh, piece of legislation in Missouri that is pro-BDS. Um, we have seen a, a kind of um, an anti-Israel piece of legislation uh, um, done by Congressman McCollum. Um, that's been introduced the past two Congresses, uh, but the, this Missouri example is, um, is disturbing, um, to say the least, and so we need to be on the watch uh, for that moving forward. Um, so how do we engage in every, in every level of government? We look to create new opportunities. Um, so for example, uh, we worked with the city of West Hollywood um, to uh, honor Israelis. Uh, you know, you think about the city of West Hollywood in California. It's a very progressive city. It's, a, it's kind of, I think, recognized as one of the more liberal places in the country, but they're also one of the most pro-Israel um, uh, cities in the country. Um, and so that's because we have found ways to uh, you know, make Israel relevant to them, make our Jewish communities relevant to them, and get our Persian Jewish and Israeli American uh, constituents um, engaged at that level. And so that's been an, an interesting uh, example. Uh, bipartisanship is not lost. Uh, I, I just mentioned the, the city of West Hollywood example. Um, what we did there again is, is to couch BDS as discrimination and it's our civil rights issue. Um, having our constituents come up and talk to city council members when we have Jewish Voice for Peace trying to push their anti-Israel agenda. Uh, we have our constituents come and talk about how their movement and their uh, narrative tries to marginalize and, and discriminate against our community. Um, it's, been a, it's been a very powerful model. It's been a very powerful approach. So what we do is we engage on domestic issues of mutual concern and interest, employing an inclusive narrative, demonstrating impact on American Jewish and Israeli communities. Um, and it's important to note that Israelis are immigrants too. We have, we have a lot of talk today, uh, immigration is a big issue. And um, this is uh, a, a very powerful narrative when Israelis can talk about their connection to their homeland and how their heritage should be respected, that they should be free to celebrate uh, their heritage and celebrate their culture free from bias and bigotry. Uh, that's a very powerful advocacy tool. Uh, here is West Hollywood. This is uh, uh, one of our activists and one of our guys here uh, in California, Aaron Friedman. Um, and he's honored here uh, during Yomazikaron, a Yomazikaron ceremony uh, in the city of West Hollywood just last year. And um, uh, this again, that's, that's the mayor of West Hollywood. And that just goes to show uh, that we can engage progressive communities um, and, uh, and push our, our narrative and really foster bipartisanship. And uh, our view is to really foster cooperation, play to our strengths, work with partner organizations, uh, share knowledge, share best practices and data. Um, how do we do it? We partner with organizations to achieve a common goal focused on advocacy and achieving tangible outcomes. Uh, what we're doing this, uh, here in, in Los Angeles is through our One Community Initiative. We're actually working with the ADL, AJC, and many other organizations, uh, also non-Jewish organizations, um, to look at how we can combat hate through advocacy uh, initiatives. Uh, this initiative is being chaired by former Los Angeles Mayor of Iragosa, um, and we're kicking it off this year, and it's been, it's been actually a great, um, already been an early success. Also, I wanted to just end by saying we should go on the offense more often. Uh, we need 
to find new ways to engage. We're often too reactionary. If our opposition isn't complying with great law enforcement exchanges, um, we see Jewish Voice for Peace working in cities across the country with their, um, uh, I think it's called the Deadly Exchange Campaign. Um, you know, we, we support the ADL and, and, and their efforts and we uh, work against uh, JVP and their efforts. Um, so we think that we, we need to find new ways and get creative and, and, and really engage these cities and, and state uh, legislatures. Um, so what's next for us in 2020 to 2022? Really focusing on defining BDS as a discriminatory movement, um, focusing on anti-Semitism awareness, that's educating legislators and policymakers about what anti-Semitism actually is, uh, looking at new legislation, looking at human relations councils, looking at um, new statutes that we can um, uh, either develop or support that will uh, better protect our communities um, and working with law enforcement. Um, we saw recently there was uh, here in this, in this era of the coronavirus, um, there was an FBI report that came out that the white supremacists are calling for attacks on Jews to infect Jews. Um, we got early warning about that through our law enforcement contacts and we were able to protect and, and inform our communities early on by engaging with uh, law enforcement. Uh, our really our significant campaign this year is we're launching a comprehensive civic education for Jewish immigrant communities. Uh, this is a, um, I, I guess, <laughs> again, in the era of coronavirus, it'll be more of an online approach. Um, so we're, we're teaching Israeli Americans and, and other uh, Jewish immigrant communities uh, about civics and, and, uh, and civic action in America. Um, and also, also we're working, uh, again, at the, the local and state level to foster greater engagement between the U.S. and Israel. We have those past examples of the California-Israel Memorandum of Understanding. Uh, we're working with State of Nevada uh, to get more business in there from Israel and to, uh, to deal with issues on sustainability. Um, and uh, we're working in other states on, on similar campaigns. Uh, so we see a great opportunity here in the next two years to, to move forward on that. One thing that we really focus on here before I end is that we're a nation striving every day to form a more perfect union. And when we look at communities like uh, Israeli immigrants or, or other Jewish immigrant communities, um, they often ask me or, or our other leadership, they say, we're a small community, we're small numbers, we don't have a lot of money, we don't have a lot of influence. And our answer to them is that if there's inequality in one of us, there's inequality in all of us. And it's important that we work hard to fight in every arena, again, at the local, state, and national level, to push back against that inequality um, so that we can be a more perfect union. Uh, movements like the BDS movement, um, anti-Semitism erodes what makes America great. And that is, um, uh, that is something that we all need to work together to, to fight back against. Uh, so I want to thank you, say um, uh, and I look forward to your questions. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dylan. Um, so the, the final speaker that we have for today, and then we're going to get to your Q&A, uh, is Rachel Fish, the Executive Director of the Foundation to Combat Extremism. So Rachel, take it away. Um, my name is Rachel Fish. Uh, just a correction, I am involved in the Foundation to Combat Anti-Semitism, which is the initiative by Mr. Robert Kraft, CEO of the New England Patriots and the New England Revolution. And this initiative is a very new initiative. Uh, it's an initiative that began in the late summer. I started in October in order to focus our efforts specifically on creating digital content for the target audience in the middle ages 13 to 35 years of age. Uh, that's a broad catch-all of a target audience but 13 because that's when most of the social channel platforms allow young people to be on them. There are some exceptions. And the middle, because we are not focused on creating digital content for those folks who already have a sensitivity to these issues. And I'll explain these issues in just a moment. Um, anything we create, of course, can be leveraged and mobilized by those individuals, but we're not targeting them and our messaging is not necessarily geared towards them. We're also not focused on the individuals that Amy's suing, the detractors, the haters. Um, we don't think that we can change the hearts and minds of those individuals through the creation of digital content, but we are trying to leverage technological capabilities that exist through artificial intelligence and other social listening um, tools that allow us to understand what these individuals, these detractors, and those who are affiliated with radicalized organizations, whether it's white supremacists, hard leftists, or radical Islamists, how they're messaging, how they're engaging in perpetrating hate-filled 
um, hate-filled literature via digital content. And what we would like to do is be able to understand that messaging and then create messaging on our own terms that is inoculating these folks in the middle so they're positively predisposed where we would like to move them to be so that longitudinally in a long-term way we can change culture, behavior, um, perceptions, and attitudes, which is a long-term goal. That's not going to happen overnight. So that's who we're focusing on. These are non-Jews and Jews in the middle. And again, the majority of these individuals that we're focused on have no idea what BDS is. They've never heard of it, Dylan. And if they've heard of it, they've only heard of it in the context of perhaps knowing that it's part of the litany of what makes one progressive, particularly on college campuses. And so we can't just talk about these issues from a Jewish perspective. We also can't talk about them with the assumption that these individuals even know what anti-Semitism is, because I'm here to tell you that they don't. Uh, we recently conducted a survey of Americans ages 13 to 35 years of age, statistically representative sample size of about 10,000 individuals. And what we saw is that anti-Semitism doesn't even come close to ranking on the concerns of forms of hatred for Americans. First of all, they're much more concerned about issues related to racism, uh, Islamophobia, homophobia, and they don't even understand the term anti-Semitism which is also why we started using the term Jew hatred, because it makes it much more explicit in terms of what we're talking about. Um, however, still overwhelming majority of young people, that group of 13 to 17 year olds, do not see Jew hatred as a problem in America in any shape or form. Uh, they actually believe that anti-Semitism is not an issue because most Jews are white. That's how they perceive the American Jewish community in particular, and also because the American Jewish community is perceived as only being a religious group and nothing beyond that, meaning a cultural or people, a nation, a tribe. Um, in addition to this, we know, and this goes to some of Dave's points earlier, that the way in which young people are engaging with the world tends to be through a modality of digital. I know that this recent events in the world have uh, required many of us to shift to being on our screens a lot more, but for the younger generation, this is where they very much live. Um, and so it's not at all surprising that what we have heard in terms of social media being the place where individuals get their information, they think that this is where they get news, this is where they also believe they are getting multiple perspectives, um, and it's also not surprising that we see a breakdown in civil discourse. Uh, the anonymity that the internet allows or um, creates a space for doesn't require individuals to engage in the same way as they would face-to-face -face interactions. So therefore, and it's not unique to the gaming world, but we absolutely see it within gaming culture, there is a degree of acceptance to that lack of civic and civil discourse. And it perpetuates this idea that Jews are both non-white and too white, which is part of the conspiracy theory around anti-Semitism, which makes it all the more so challenging to address. However, that being said, and I, I firmly agree with Amy here, that in order for us to begin to address it specifically for these folks in the middle, the don't knows as we refer to them, that we have to be able to put the Jew hatred conversation in conversation with other forms of hatred and bigotry and prejudice. Now, we all know that anti-Semitism has some unique characteristics. There's no doubt about that. But if we don't put it in conversation with these other forms of prejudice, then we will absolutely not resonate with our target audience. Um, we have to be able to meet them where they are and ultimately for the foundation to combat anti-Semitism and the work that we're doing, our purpose is to raise sensitivities, to educate through digital content and to make and help others understand that Jew hatred must be socially unacceptable in the 21st century, along with these other forms of hatred and bigotry. Now I will say that one of our sort of values as the foundation is that 
we do not want to politicize anti-Semitism. So wherever it rears its ugly head, we will address it. So that means on college campuses from the hard leftist activists, whether it's Jewish Voices for Peace, whether it's Students for Justice in Palestine or other manifestations, we will go after Jew hatred. Whether it's from the hard right with white supremacists, neo-Nazis, we will target it. And whether it's from radical Islamist organizations, we will target it. Um, again, how we target it becomes a question of tactical messaging and using analytics to figure out what um, resonates with our audience and how we can slowly begin to move the needle. An additional piece of the work that we are thinking about is what does it mean in order to try to create some key performance indicators around the digital content we create. Uh, basic analytics that some of these platforms, whether it's Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, whatever it may be, um, that provide some information around views, likes, shares, impressions, engagements, all these very important words um, is not enough in order to help us understand if we're ultimately going to be able to create that longitudinal change. Because it's not just about being able to say someone clicked on it, but we need to be able to see, are we sparking curiosities? Are we engaging people in conversation? Are we ultimately able to create something sticky and substantive enough that we can create additional scaffolding so that young people continue to come back to the content we're creating and also lead them to other content that currently exists? And my hope long term is that we actually get them off the screen into in-person experiential learning opportunities so that um, it can actually resonate and become part of their DNA. That's a long-term vision for an organization that started about six and a half months ago, but we're getting there. The other piece that I would like to add to this conversation is that in the survey that we conducted, we recognized that our 13 to 35 year old target audience has many sub segmentations. And what I mean by that is what we do for 13 year old boys who like sports on TikTok social channel, which for those of you who are not familiar with it, gives me all of 45 seconds to talk about a very complex big idea in a very short amount of time, um, versus what I do for the 35-year-old evangelical couple who has two children, who's very good on Israel, but actually holds some anti-Jewish sentiment, right? Needs to be very different again than from what I do for the 22-year-old college kid who's part of Black Lives Matter and is engaging with the deadly exchange movement because it seems to be part of a litany of progressivism. All of the messaging has to be different. The content has to be curated appropriately. And only once we begin to do some A-B testing and really getting a sense of what resonates, what doesn't, where we can move the needle, in addition to, of course, having to go on the offensive strategy approach where needed and where appropriate, to expose not just the discrimination that Dylan was talking about, but to expose the absurdity and hypocrisy and really using the elements of good storytelling because that's what's required in order for people to continue to look at the screen. We need to be able to evoke emotion appropriately, not manipulate it, and we need to be able to have those elements of storytelling that include humor, comedy, tragedy, romance, irony, because without that, people are not gonna stick around to watch this. And I heard some insane statistic the other day that on YouTube alone, every hour, 400 hours of content is placed. So just to cut through that noise is not a simple task and will require us to learn as we progress in this, um, in this first stage of building out our digital content and our social channels and once we begin to get a sense from the analytics, we'll have a better um, ability, I hope, to be able to target these different sub-segmentations within our audiences in order to ultimately be able to have an impact. The last thing that I would just say, and, and then I'm happy to turn it over to you, Dave, is that in each of the work that I hear from Amy and Dylan and Dave, um, I am not the grandchild of Holocaust survivors. However, I really deeply believe that when we see 
anti-Semitism in our societies, it is the fraying of democracy. And when we see this fraying of democracy and the othering of the other, it is our responsibility as Jews to be able to stand up against it, to educate in order that it does not happen, to make bystanders feel a sense of responsibility, and ultimately to be able long-term to find a way to humanize and to humanize Jews and to humanize Israel. So I leave on that note and I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. <clears throat> All right, um, so it is now right on the hour. So we're gonna be extending this by about 10 minutes. We do have one question so far. Um, I'm also just typing into the chat. So if you noticed, if you're new to this and you just noticed something just started blinking at the bottom of your screen, that you can just tap on that or click on that. That's the chat box and you can add your questions in there and we'll get to see them. So uh, the question is for you, Dylan. It's from an anonymous attendee uh, who states, thank you, Mr. Hosier, for your presentation and your efforts in strengthening the Israel and US alliance. It's my understanding that your organization is not the only one involved in fighting BDS. Others I'm aware of are AIPAC and in AJC. What is being done to synergize with other organizations that are doing this important work as resources are not unlimited? Thanks, Dave. <laughs> yeah, great question. Um, so APAC, as we know, focuses on Congress and they've done a phenomenal job um, uh, over many years, of course, of pushing legislation um, at the federal level. Um, I know they're hard at work uh, on very important legislation um, within Congress last Last year, uh, Senate Bill 1 was passed, which contained some uh, anti-BDS provisions. I know uh, APAC worked very hard on that with uh, um, Senator Rubio's office. Um, there are efforts, I understand, behind the scenes to get the Israel Anti-Boycott Act um, uh, kind of passed. I don't know if it'll happen this, this Congress, hopefully next Congress. Um, it, what that bill does is that bill extends the anti-boycott provisions that apply to the Arab League boycott to the UN and to the EU. I think that bill is extremely important, just as we saw recently the, um, the blacklist uh, database uh, being released by the United Nations. Um, I think that kind of places new urgency on getting that bill passed. Uh, there is a version of that bill that's been introduced in the House um, by uh, Representative Zeldin, um, but unfortunately it doesn't look like um, House leadership is going to look th uh, let that move forward. Um, at the state level, uh, you know, anti-BDS has kind of uh, fizzled out to a certain extent. Uh, there was a kind of a five-year campaign. Um, you know, we've we've looked at doing uh, anti-BDS in, in, um, in a few other states. Um, we've focused on Massachusetts. Um, doesn't look like it's going to move forward again this session. I think that's been tried in Massachusetts four times now. It's just an extremely difficult state to get legislation passed. Um, in that effort, we uh, coordinated and collaborated with partners on the ground. Um, AJC has been a phenomenal partner. Um, unfortunately, APAC doesn't typically work um, uh, in other levels of government below uh, Congress. Um, but um, I, I think that working with organizations like uh, uh, AJC, even ADL, um, and others um, is very important. And also engaging, uh, we've had some success also engaging non-Jewish organizations as well, um, talking with the Armenian community and other communities, uh, Latino communities um, in supporting this legislation and really understanding that, um, again, as Rachel had mentioned, um, when we're looking at, at uh, anti-Semitism and at BDS, and we, again, we see BDS as an anti-Semitic movement, um, it's important that we really characterize this as a fraying of our democracy um, that really um, undercuts what America is about, uh, undercuts the fabric of our society, and that um, if, ant if anti-Semitism goes forward unchecked, uh, it really is a canary in the coal mine that can affect all communities, and we've had a great success in engaging others um, uh, in that narrative. All right, thank you, Dylan. Um, we do have, we have another question, uh, this one from Nancy K. Kaufman. Uh, I hope I pronounced your name right, Nancy. Um, we, and this is part, it seems like it's a two-sided question, partly for Amy and partly for Dylan. Um, so one is, Amy, what is your public engagement strategy? And I think there was a second piece of this that uh, Nancy said she doesn't agree with Dylan that ACLU is the enemy. And so, so maybe just a, a comment on that, on those two things. Amy, why don't you go first? 
Sure. So I think um, for us, and this is something that seems to be consistent across the board here, our, our direct action, this litigation that we're supporting is, is the crux of our work, but we also believe it provides a unique opportunity to truly engage the public in this issue of anti-Semitism and white supremacy and, and make sure folks understand the extent of this crisis. So at the very least, the fact that we are going to be having a four to six week jury trial in Charlottesville where we put the leaders of this movement on the stand and hold them accountable for the violence that they planned and executed, um, that will be not just about the case itself, but really a moment for the country to start grappling with this issue and understand the extent of the crisis. It will be, have, it, it'll be covered by the national media on a near da daily basis. Um, whether it's happening in October or slightly thereafter, I think it'll be happening at an important point in our national conversation about who we are as a country, the values we represent, um, and the broader crisis of extremism that we're facing. Um, and so the trial itself, as our lead counsel, Robbie Kaplan, likes to say, is not just about the two parties, but really in line um, with a history of trials that have been about much more than the parties, about um, really uh, waking up the public consciousness to a broader crisis, a broader issue, going back to the Scopes Monkey trial through some of the marriage equality litigation not that long ago. Um, and we believe that this will be that case um, for this moment. Um, however, we are not just resting on the trial itself. Um, we are also running an aggressive public engagement strategy between now, the third anniversary of the Charlottesville violence this August, and the trial itself this fall. Um, that includes engaging a number of different stakeholders. First, interfaith clergy. So clergy are on the front lines of white supremacist violence. We've seen that firsthand with white supremacists targeting African-American churches, synagogues, mosques, Sikh temples. Um, and so we have been aggressively engaging interfaith clergy um, in this work and making sure folks understand um, the ways in which anti-Semitism and these other forms of hate are deeply interconnected and that there are tools to fight back, including through our case. So we have an interfaith clergy Toolkit um, between, uh, uh, between the anniversary and um, the, the trial itself, like we are on the actual third anniversary of Charlottesville, we'll be releasing a large interfaith clergy letter that brings together hundreds of interfaith clergy members from around the country, calling out the crisis of anti Semitism, racism, and white supremacy, and supporting this case. And we're engaging clergy in a number of other ways. Um, we've also been doing that through large scale public events, which we are now having to have, uh, have to adapt. But up until a couple weeks ago, um, we were speaking at synagogues and other houses of worship with events uh, co-sponsored by large interfaith groups um, that saw upwards of 500 attendees, underscoring that there really is a hunger among not just the Jewish community, but the broader faith community to engage in this issue um, and figure out something tangible to do in the fight. Uh, against white supremacy and anti-Semitism. Um, we also have a number of other strategies on the public engagement front, including partnering with the Coalition of Holocaust Museum Directors um, from around the country who have been a vocal um, voice in this, both through events and their own um, public, uh, their own public letters and op-eds that they plan to publish around the anniversary and the trial. Um, civil liberties experts, we have a number of folks, while the ACLU is conflicted out of our case because they secured the original permit for um, the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, um, a number of ACLU lay leaders and others are, pub are uh, publicly supportive of our case, making clear that this is not about speech, but about conspiracy and action, um, which we think is important and we'll be highlighting them. Um, and the, the sort of the list goes on. One final thing that I'll note um, is that the ADL has actually become a formal partner with IFA as well in this fight. They've invested directly in the case, um, which I think is fairly unprecedented for one nonprofit to support another this way. And we are very grateful and speaks to the urgency of this um, and are also partnering with us through their Center on Extremism. Um, and other folks at the ADL to highlight this crisis of white supremacy and white nationalism. And I suspect that we'll be continuing to do that together along with um, a number of other organizations working in the anti-extremism um, and interfaith and Jewish communal spaces between now and the trial. So just to comment briefly on uh, ACLU, um, I, I certainly wouldn't call them the enemy. I, I would say that, um, we have seen, unfortunately, in some states, um, we've seen them oppose measures which 
clearly do not have um, speech issues, which clearly do not have First Amendment um, uh, issues. Uh, so for example, um, in the last legislature in Massachusetts, there was a, a very clear um, anti-discrimination statute that we had supported that, um, uh, by the way, would have protected all uh, um, minority communities and, and uh, uh, protected communities. Uh, ACLU came out and opposed that um, and uh, one shocking statement that they had made uh, in public during the legislative hearing was that Israelis did not deserve equal protection uh, because they were um, uh, acting as agents of the state of, of Israel, um, not as uh, citizens um, or residents of, of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Uh, and we've seen similar examples like that. Again, that's, that's more maybe at the state level, maybe ACLU national is, is, is different. Um, we have seen, uh, again, um, um, the measure with the Israel Anti-Boycott Act in Congress, uh, the ACLU has come out very strongly in opposition to that, um, citing uh, speech issues. Um, but again, um, I think there's legal consensus across the board that there are no speech issues or First Amendment issues uh, with that piece of legislation, um, and, and yet they've come out and, and opposed it. I, I would not characterize them as an enemy. I think they can be um, good allies in, in, in some cases, but we have seen on cases as it relates to BDS and other matters, um, they have uh, kind of opposed us um, on frankly confusing grounds. All right, thanks. And I wanna present a, a question for Rachel. Um, Rachel, can you tell us about the kinds of content you're creating for 13 to 35 year olds? And how do you know what you're doing is working to inoculate people? Like, how do you, how do you measure that? Sure, so we're very, in the very early stages of creating content and we'll test it and get analytics and have a sense of if it's having an impact or not. I think it's going to be a longer term um, process, Dave, to be able to have some answers because the data will have to drive some of that content. We do believe that there are two kind of pieces though in order to think through this strategy, which is developing content that resonates where some of these individuals currently are in their lives. So for example, um, the name of the organization is currently the Foundation to Combat Anti-Semitism. I can tell you that 13 to 17 year olds don't even know what any of that is, right? So we have to change the name of, those, of the brand even for the social channels because they wouldn't go to a social channel that says Foundation to Combat Anti-Semitism. Um, and the content that we will create strategically will be two types of content areas. One is going to be, I think, more around that storytelling, emotion, laying the groundwork for humanizing Jews and putting Jew hatred in conversation with other forms of bigotry and prejudice and race and, um, and bias. Uh, and then the second kind of strategical approach has to do with going on the offensive and really exposing in a very, I think, um, sophisticated way but in a way that's accessible and digestible, some of the hypocrisy and absurdity around the anti-Semitic positions that are held, but again, specific to the ways in which they manifest in conversations in the environment that these individuals from our target audience are located. Great, all right, well, I'm gonna close with one big question for all of our panelists here, uh, and we only have two minutes to get it answered. Um, so, let's talk about the pandemic. How are extremists trying to exploit the pandemic? Right? We've all alluded to it, but I mean, there's certainly a lot to say. Anyone have something that they want to comment on that? Two minutes. This is something we've been closely following at IFA. I imagine others have too. So, I mean, certainly we've seen a dramatic rise in anti-Semitic conspiracy theories online, blaming the Jewish community for coronavirus, saying that we've been hiding vaccines, whatever, you know, you, you name it, I'm sure there's a conspiracy theory out there on the internet saying that we are to blame for this. We've been following that. I know the ADL has been doing great research on that front too. Certainly anti-Asian attacks are on the, on the uptick, both in terms of um, the actual, uh, actually direct attacks in communities around the country, which is alarming and, and online. And I think most alarming is the fact that there were reports just yesterday and over the weekend that white supremacists plan to use the coronavirus as a bioweapon against Jews and law enforcement. They, they were talking about this on a platform called Telegram, which is a social media site that a number of the defendants in our suit frequent 
all the time um, and has been sort of a hotbed for white supremacist activity in recent years. Um, they frequently shift between sites um, and Telegram is one of their latest places that they've um, been congregating. Um, and so it is certainly underscored more than anything that the crisis of white supremacy and that the urgency of addressing white supremacist terror is not just equally um, as important as it was before this pandemic, but even more important right now in the midst of a pandemic when you see how these extremists are exploiting it to spread hate and terror and fear. Um, and so it really just makes us even more resolved um, in terms of our work, not to speak on behalf of the other panelists, but I imagine they feel the same way. Um, and I will uh, leave it there. Um, and, I, I, I yep. say, and, and sorry, know, I'm sorry, Dylan, I'm gonna have to cut you off here. Yeah, they, they just wanna say thank you to everyone for joining us and, uh, and for such great questions across the board.